All right, future CFA champs, let's embark on a journey into the world of sovereign debt and its close cousins, non-sovereign, quasi-government, and supranational debt. These debt instruments are like the lifeblood of global finance, issued by countries, local governments, and big international organizations to fund everything from infrastructure to public services. They're critical because they set the benchmark for the entire fixed income market. So grab your notebooks and let's break down the essentials. What is sovereign debt? Let's kick things off with the big one, sovereign debt. Simply put, sovereign debt is the debt issued by a country's national government. Think of it like this. The government wants to build a new highway or fund a public health program, but it doesn't have enough cash on hand. What does it do? It borrows money by issuing bonds. The cool part? Governments can use their exclusive power to tax their citizens to pay back this debt. The U.S. Treasury issues Treasury bonds, notes, and bills to fund federal spending. These securities are seen as some of the safest investments globally because Uncle Sam has the full faith and credit of the U.S. government backing them up. Uh, but it's not just the U.S. Every country does this, from the U.K. to Japan to Brazil. Governments issue debt to fund public services, and the type of debt they issue short-term, like Treasury bills, medium term like treasury notes or long term like treasury bonds depends on their needs and economic strategies let's talk about the accounting and economic impact when it comes to public sector finances now public sector accounting is all about cash flows it's focused on the here and now tracking the money coming in and going out without worrying about things like asset depreciation or future liabilities. It's like looking at your checking account, but ignoring the fact that your car is losing value or that you've got a big loan to pay off down the road. On the other hand, an economic balance sheet gives a much more complete view of public finances because it factors in future revenues and expenditures. It's like having the full picture where you account for everything on the horizon, not just what's happening today. Developed markets, DM, are your stable economies like the US, Germany, and Japan. They issue debt in major reserve currencies like USD, EUR, JPY, and have unrestricted access across maturities. Emerging markets, EM, are more volatile with governments often facing economic instability. EM sovereign debt might be issued in domestic or foreign currencies, which can shift currency risk to the issuer's ability to generate foreign currency. Let's talk about Ricardian equivalence, which suggests that the choice a government makes about the maturity of its debt doesn't really impact the present value of future tax cash flows, assuming certain conditions hold. The idea here is that taxpayers know that any government debt issued now will eventually be paid off with future taxes, so they don't really care if the debt is short-term or long-term. It's all the same to them. But when we loosen some of these strict assumptions, it opens up the possibility for more strategic debt management policies. Governments might opt for a mix of short-term and long-term debt, considering liquidity needs and offering investors a range of maturity options. Short-term debt is great for liquidity and safety, often acting as a substitute for bank deposits, but relying too much on it can lead to rollover risk and higher volatility in future tax rates. Governments need to manage their debt carefully to ensure they don't get in over their heads. 
This involves balancing between short-term and long-term debt to manage risks like interest rate volatility and rollover risk. Short-term debt. Think treasury bills. These provide high liquidity but come with higher rollover risks. Long-term debt. Think 30-year treasury bonds. These provide stability and serve as benchmarks for other debt instruments, making them great for hedging interest rate risks and providing collateral in financial markets. The U.S. government uses a mix of short-term T-bills for immediate cash needs and long-term T-bonds to lock in low borrowing costs over a longer period. This mix helps balance liquidity and stability. Now, let's talk about how sovereign debt is actually issued and traded. Unlike corporate bonds, sovereign debt is usually issued through public auctions managed by a country's treasury department. This allows for broad participation and potentially lower borrowing costs. Competitive versus non-competitive bids. Investors have two options here. In a competitive bid, you set your own price, but there's a risk. You might not get the bonds if your bid isn't high enough. In a non-competitive bid, you accept whatever price is set at auction, guaranteeing you'll get some bonds. Now let's talk about single price versus multiple price auctions. In a single price auction, everyone pays the same price, making it fairer, but potentially more expensive for the government. In a multiple price auction, you pay what you bid, so you better bid wisely. Let's say the UK government wants to issue 1 billion pounds in 10 year bonds. They announce the auction and investors submit their bids. If it's a single price auction, all winning bidders pay the same price, determined by the highest yield that fills the offering. If it's a multiple price auction, each investor pays their individual bid price. Simple, right? All right, let's break down how a single price auction works, step by step. First up, we have the announcement. This is when the government lets everyone know the details of the auction, including how much they're offering, what type of bonds are up for grabs, and how long those bonds will be around before they mature. Next, we move to bidding. Investors submit their bids, and the bids are ranked based on the lowest yield. Remember, lower yield means higher price, so everyone's trying to get in at the best rate. Now comes the crucial part, the cutoff yield. This is the highest yield within the offering that sets the final price. And guess what? All the winning bids get the bonds at that price, hence single price. Lastly, it's deliverance time. Successful bidders hand over their cash and get the bonds in return. Simple, right? Okay, let's talk about the role of primary dealers. While sovereign issuers bypass traditional investment banks, they still work with primary dealers. These are financial intermediaries who participate in auctions and help manage the flow of government bonds in the secondary market. They're crucial for maintaining liquidity and ensuring the smooth functioning of government bond markets. Here's a bit of jargon you'll wanna know. On the run and off the run securities. On the run are the most recently issued government securities. They're super liquid and often used as benchmarks for yield analysis. Think of them as the newest model on the car lot. Off the run are older issues that are less liquid and trade less frequently. They're like that slightly older model sitting further back on the lot, still valuable, but not as hot. Who buys sovereign debt? Sovereign debt attracts a wide range of investors, from central banks, using them for monetary policy, to foreign governments, holding them as currency reserves, to banks and insurance companies meeting regulatory requirements. The US dollar is the world's reserve currency. 
about 60% of global foreign exchange reserves are held in U.S. dollars, making U.S. treasuries extremely popular among foreign governments, central banks, and international investors. Now let's shift gears to non-sovereign quasi-government and supranational debt. These are debt instruments issued by local or regional governments, government agencies, or big international organizations like the World Bank, or IMF. Non-sovereign debt. These are bonds issued by local governments, like states or cities, or government agencies like the New York Metropolitan Transportation Authority. They are often used to fund local projects like schools, highways, or hospitals. The repayment comes from local taxes or specific revenues like tolls. General Obligation GO. Bonds backed by the issuer's full faith and credit, supported by tax revenues. Revenue bonds backed by revenues from specific projects like toll roads or utilities. Think of them like pay-as-you-go. Quasi-government debt are bonds issued by entities that are government-sponsored but operate independently, like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac in the U.S. They typically enjoy some government backing but don't carry a full government guarantee. Supranational debt is where the big players like the World Bank and IMF come in they issue debt to fund international projects and provide stability to global financial markets. They have high credit quality due to support from multiple sovereign governments. The Asian Development Bank might issue bonds denominated in Indian rupees, but pay investors in U.S. dollars. This setup exposes investors to currency risk, depending on the exchange rates between Indian rupee and U.S. dollar. And that's a wrap, folks. Sovereign, non-sovereign, and supranational debt instruments are essential parts of the global financial system. They provide governments and organizations with the funds needed to operate and grow while offering investors a range of opportunities across the risk spectrum. Understanding these markets is crucial for any budding financial analyst or CFA candidate. So keep these lessons in mind, dive into those practice questions, and get ready to tackle any exam question that comes your way. Until next time, keep analyzing and happy studying.